Libya's transition must proceed in a spirit of reconciliation and justice, not retribution or reprisal. Today, world leaders debating the future of Libya 42 years after Gaddafi first took power. In Paris, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and other world leaders met with the leaders of Libya's National Transitional Council. Even Russia has now acknowledged the rebels' transitional government as Libya's ruling and legitimate authority. But Gaddafi remains defiant. In a radio address today, he again insisted he won't surrender. And anti-Gaddafi forces have forced Gaddafi into hiding after taking control of Tripoli 12 days ago. They're now giving loyalists an extra week to negotiate surrender. Riva Bal is director of analysis at Stratfor, a global consulting company advising governments and multinationals. And Sajin Gohel is director for international security for the Asia Pacific Foundation. Welcome, Riva. Let me start with you. Uh, what did you what, what did you make of where we are in terms of the meeting today in Paris? The 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 real acceleration now in terms of recognizing and trying to work closely with this transitional council. What, in your view, are the most important priorities in the in the weeks ahead? Well, clearly, Gaddafi has not capitulated. The war is not over. And I don't think that should come as that much of a surprise. The more you see these calls for members of the Gaddafi regime to be placed on trial at The Hague, the less room you leave for retreat. And that is exactly what prolongs the war. And so Gaddafi really does not have any incentive uh, to negotiate, to surrender, even if that's what the rebels are hoping for. And he may not, he was a tyrant, but he really isn't all that isolated. And so all he really has to do to continue to pose problems and extend the war is to survive. Remember that Saddam Hussein was found in a hole without an army. Gaddafi doesn't need several army divisions uh, to continue this war. He really needs to just show that he can hold out. It's not looking great for him, but he can bet that chaotic conditions will prevail in Libya the more we see fissures within the coalition amongst the rebel opposition come to the fore. Now, Sajin, at the same time, uh, this fractured but, you know, trying to unify transitional council has its hands full trying to provide security, uh, pr trying to make sure that, you know, there, there's running water, that the lights are on, that basic services are met. This is a group that hasn't had to do something like this before. Can the West uh, be helpful and can they pull it off? Well, ultimately, this has to be a Libyan-owned future. The key dynamics are to deliver on democracy, stable economy, and importantly, national unity. It, the hard part of uh, removing uh, Gaddafi's central forces uh, has been partly resolved. But now, as you mentioned, the key services have to be instituted. Uh, money that has been frozen internationally has to be handed back to the country. Uh, it's important that Libya can function. It's a country with enormous natural resources. And I think many people are remembering the examples and failures in Iraq post Saddam Hussein. No one wants to see that happen in this country. It's strategically an important area. You have groups affiliated to al-Qaeda that border Libya that may want to take advantage of the situation. One doesn't want insecurity. That is the primary concern. And if the different factions can resolve their differences, because they're very varied. You have conservative secularists, former Gaddafi loyalists, uh, people who were living abroad, uh, as well as tribes from the east and west. They're going to have to overcome those difficulties if they're going to be able to ensure a more stable Libya in the future. Now, Riva, uh, are we, should we be expecting that uh, American personnel as well as European personnel, uh, kind of civilian nation builders, are going to be expected to parachute in to try and help make sure that the, this transitional council is able, is able to do the basic blocking and tackling of uh, basic governance so that this thing doesn't collapse even before it's uh, fully born? I think that's something that's being negotiated right now, especially as the Americans and the Europeans are just now figuring out who exactly they've been supporting for the past several weeks and months. And it's, so far, it's really not a pretty picture. If you even just look um, at the surface, you see the head of the Tripoli Military Council, somebody named Abdul Hakim uh, Balhaj, who was a former leader of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group tightly associated with al-Qaeda, um, was even named by al-Zawahiri um, in Afghanistan, fought in Afghanistan. Um, this is a very prominent figure within the rebel opposition camp. And you know, the concern here is that the fall of Gaddafi, if and when that happens, is going to create a major political vacuum in the country that Islamist militants can exploit. Now, Sajan, uh, 
One of the things I've been very worried about, as well as lots of observers, is the weapons stockpiles that Gaddafi had in various parts of the country and the fear that that stuff now could get, you know, because, because of the disruption and chaos, could get into the wrong hands. What are the steps we need to take to make sure that that doesn't happen? And are you confident that we can uh, prevent these kind of things like uh, anti-aircraft missiles that are portable, which if they got into terrorist hands could be a disaster for the West, that this won't happen and get into the wrong hands? Uh, again, uh, lessons need to be learned from I Iraq. Weapon stockpiles were often uh, utilized by insurgents and extremists in Iraq uh, to carry out attacks against coalition forces. Uh, keep in mind that Libya is a far bigger country, uh, predominantly inhabited in the northern part of the country, uh, otherwise surrounded by the Sahara, but places for individuals uh, to base themselves, to hide, to seek sanctuary, to take advantage of the situation. Uh, there are a lot of challenges and questions now that have to be dealt with, uh, and the uh, National Transitional Council really has its hands full. In, in trying to tackle these different uh, issues because of the fact that the security apparatus is very weak. There is no formal structure to replace uh, Gaddafi's forces. Uh, you have this hodgepodge of different elements, all with potentially conflicting agendas, uh, and some may try and seize the opportunity to bolster their own uh, case. And that's where the West, especially France and Britain, are going to have to play a, a more direct role in ensuring that they don't stray from the, the platform of commitment to democracy and also ensuring uh, stability and a, an effective security apparatus. Sajin Gohel and Riva Bala, thanks for joining me today to illuminate the stakes uh, as we look at Libya's future. Here now on how Gaddafi's fall in Libya may bring justice for the Lockerbie victims is MSNBC contributor Imogen Lloyd Webber with her debut daily rant. Take it away. Thank you. It has been repeatedly asserted that the release of the only convicted Lockerbie bomber, McGrahi, has done more to damage British relations with the American general public than anything since the 1956 Suez Crisis. Scotland has a separate legal system to the rest of the UK, and McGrahi was tried under Scottish law in the Netherlands. He was convicted of 270 counts of murder for the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. The victims included 189 Americans and 43 British citizens. McGrahi was released by the Scottish to Libya in 2009 on compassionate grounds, supposedly with three months to live. The Scottish obviously made an extremely bad judgment call. Two years later, and McGrahi is still alive in Tripoli, albeit, according to the reporter who recently discovered him, appearing to be at death's door. I would like to take this opportunity to perhaps reiterate to America that there was an utter outcry throughout Britain about McGrahi's release not least from our current Prime Minister David Cameron, who was not in power at the time. Gaddafi's regime was by no means Britain's best friend. Lockerbie remains the UK's biggest terrorist atrocity. In 1984, a British police officer, Yvonne Fletcher, was shot and killed while policing a protest outside the Libyan embassy. The diplomats responsible within invoked diplomatic immunity and escaped. The Libyans used to supply arms to the IRA, so McGrahi's release was greeted with much disgust in the UK. Those responsible for allowing him to return to Libya continue to claim that it was solely a Scottish legal decision and that there was no conspiracy involved. That hasn't stopped some, such as former UN Ambassador John Bolton, from claiming that McGrahi's release was for British oil interests. Would the Scots really be manipulated by the English for oil? Knowing the Scots, I'd venture not. But I will also say this. If you buy into the conspiracy theory that the McGrahi release wasn't a Scottish legal decision and instead the British government made it, I can't see how the UK, which has been accurately described in recent years as America's poodle, would have made the call without the tacit approval of the US government. Blair supposedly had the Bush administrations when he met with Gaddafi in 2004. Truth will come out in the end. There will eventually be the release of the British, Scottish and American government's classified documents. In the near term, the fall of the Gaddafi regime may finally reveal some new evidence. McGrahi's conviction has been repeatedly called into question, and there are undoubtedly other perpetrators of the Lockerbie tragedy still at large. The Scottish investigation into the bombing has remained open. The British people stand with their American counterparts, demanding that the Lockerbie victims' families and loved ones get the answers they deserve. 
Imogen, you could be ambassador. Imogen Lloyd Webber. That was a very good uh, and very able and eloquent articulation that of the aligned British and American interests against this. One of the things I thought that was interesting today, we've only got to about 30 seconds, is Hillary Clinton. Yeah. It, the meetings in Paris did bring up with the transitional council, even though they've got a lot of other uh, things on their mind in terms of trying to stabilize the situation in Libya, the same issues about wanting to get this guy, feeling that injustice was done. That's a positive thing, don't you exactly. think? Exactly. Justice has not been done. We need to find out what happened. The families absolutely deserve that. And this is our chance now with the fall of the Gaddafi regime. We might now finally have those answers. And it's nice to see that both British and American uh, officials yeah. can be pursuing this now. Just about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Do you expect that we're actually going to find and, and, and find a way to actually bring him to justice and, and have more justice done for others who might have been involved? Just briefly. I think we can hope so, we can pray so. It is so important to those families, they do get that justice. Obviously, we're going to be watching this in the period ahead. Terrific debut rant, Imogen Lloyd Webber. So thanks for doing that.